Good afternoon. Uh, we're calling this meeting to order Downtown Aviation Economy and Innovation Subcommittee. Today is March 13th, 2018. Uh, to my right, you have Councilwoman Thelda Williams, and to my left, you have Councilman Nowakowski. Uh, I believe, do we have anything called to the public? No. No? Okay. Uh, minutes of the meeting? Move approval. Second. Uh, I have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, the motion passes. We're on consent actions items two through five. Item Anybody? Uh, do I have a motion for two through five? I would move approval, but we do have a card on item four. Okay. Item four, uh, Brent Kleinman. And second to approve everything except for item four. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item number four. Brent. <laughs> Wasn't sure. We didn't vote on that item. <laughs> Committee chair, members of the council. Um, I just I know this was a consent item and it will be going through. I just want to put my two cents in saying what a important building this is and I really hope that this continues and we are um, in favor of getting some grant money to the synagogue and getting it back to hopefully what it once was and the, the glory it was. So thank you all for approving this money and moving it forward. Thank you, Brent. Um, is there a motion for item four? Uh, second. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. 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 All right, great, thank you. Moving on now, and thank you, Vice Mayor, for starting our meeting. Uh, moving on to item five. Item six. Item six. Key Phoenix Economic Indicators. This is the quarterly report. It is just for information. So uh, if, if we want a presentation or if anyone has any questions, comments, then we can just we can move to item seven. Okay. All right. Item seven is now this is for the discussion of possible action, the community facilities district or districts. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I'm Denise Olson. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. And with me here today is Alan from Planning, which you all know, and also Chris from CED. Um, we have been working on a combined effort to develop a new or revise our existing policy on community facilities districts. Um, this isn't a new thing, but we do have some new changes to the state law. So we've revised our existing City of Phoenix policy. And again, it's been a collaborative effort between um, finance, planning, CED, and the law department. So today, we just want to talk about what those revisions to the policy are and ask for um, your approval and forwarding that to the council. So first, let's just talk about what is a community facilities district. And simply put, we, we call it a CFD. And also, it's just a mechanism to finance public infrastructure in a designated area. So basically, we issue debt, and then we repay that debt based on the backs of the property owners, so it's not the city of Phoenix, and we do it through a special assessment on the property tax bill. So some examples of what public infrastructure can be financed through a community facilities district includes water and wastewater lines. Um, some other things that we commonly see is lighting and traffic control systems, and also streets and parks just to name a few. A little bit of background, again, community facilities districts, they're not new. Um, they were established <coughs> by state law in 1988. In May of 1991, the city of Phoenix formed a policy for community facilities districts and also a process. Um, however, we've had revisions to the state law, which was Senate Bill 1480, and that happened in April of 2017. We've revised um, the policy. We also have vetted this policy through stakeholders. 
We did that in January of 2018, and that is what we're bringing forth to the subcommittee today. A little bit of background, we have had one community facilities district since 1988, and that was for Tatum Ranch. That was formed in June of 1991. It was about 800 acres. We issued 6.7 million in bonds. Those bonds were paid off by the property owners in July of 2016, and the district dissolved in May of 2017. So the changes that we're looking at now, uh, one of the most important things is now the city council has to hold a public meeting and act within 60 days of when we receive a community facilities district's application. If the council does not adopt a resolution to form a CFD, they, asked, they have to specify in writing specific changes on what needs to be changed in order for the CFD to be approved in the, in the future. Next, the law also says that upon a formation of a CFD, there has to be two additional board members, and these are appointed by the majority landowner. It also limits the fees that the city can charge to $15,000 per application, and the CFDs must establish and maintain an official website. That's so that the public has access to all the information in terms of the CFD. So with that, I'll turn this over to Alan, who will talk about changes to the process. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rounds, well, members of the subcommittee. The formation process that as staff envisions this uh, really looks at trying to replicate some of our um, existing submittal processes. So we have a pre-application meeting uh, and a preliminary meeting with the idea being that we want to try and work things out with a proposer early on in the process. And so because we only have a 60-day clock, once we get that final application, staff is proposing some advance work to make sure that once we get that final application, things are in really good shape uh, so that we can work on, here's the final things we have to do in order to recommend approval to the mayor and council, work with the public, do those things, because that 60 days is not a lot of time uh, to really evaluate a CFD. And so you'll see the first thing we have would be having a meeting with a planning development department director where I would then ask appropriate staff to be involved. So for example, if there was uh, you know, this had all the public infrastructure that was listed as eligible that Denise just showed on the slide, we'd include all those different staff. If it was just something that was a, a single use kind of issue of, hey, they needed help getting a, a water sewer line, you know, a mile away and connected into that, it'd be a much more focused one where it would be a discussion with just the water department, uh, you know, as well as planning and development being the, the lead in trying to bring all that stuff together. If there was economic development purposes involved, we'd have Chris Mackey and her staff involved. And so that's where we'd have this initial meeting, have a discussion about, okay, here's what they propose. We would then tell them, here's the things you need to go look at and do. Because there's a wide variety of different types of applications that may come forward where they may want you know, a single use of infrastructure, they may want everything, it's the, the application thing will be tailored to how they bring that forward. So that's why this preamp will tell them, okay, for example, you want uh, streets and, and traffic and you want lights to be included in there, we need a traffic study to tell us what all that is so we can review and evaluate all that stuff. We would review all of that. We'd also then work closely with the finance department to determine financial feasibility. And this really gets down to what level of infrastructure are they proposing as it relates to the debt that the property can carry and, and repay. And so that is something that the finance department will be involved in and in charge in, of helping us determine that with that private property owner who's proposing the CFD as it comes forward. So we give them back their comments as part of that uh, with that pre-application. Then they would go and address any of those requirements uh, that we would say, revise your plan to show X, Y, and Z, whatever those would be. They would then come back and do a preliminary application where then we would uh, submit that to us and then we would do a final review of that, have a meeting with them, go over and explain any issues or outstanding things that need to be addressed. We have a, a goal timeline for each of these. That first pre-application would be a 15-day turnaround. The uh, overall prelim would be a 30-day turnaround where we provide responses to them, which is in line with some of our other processes and how we turn things around. And then they would make any final changes as part of that uh, to then make their final submittal. And that final submittal is when that 60 days would come forward where then we would say, okay, now we're doing any kind of public outreach, any discussions we have then relative to those issues, and we'd schedule it to for the city council to have a, a hearing on it. And because 
uh, the state statute, as Denise uh, referenced, requires that the council make a finding of why this isn't something that uh, is supported from the council's perspective. We will try and have those details flushed out ahead of time, so that way there can be a, a good discussion. Hopefully all the issues are worked out. If not, people will know going into that staff doesn't support it because of whatever the reasons are, and that would be the part of the justification that council would use to say, well, we really can't enter into the CFD at this time, and here's why because you have to then provide those findings back to whoever proposed it, uh, you know, whenever council makes their decision. Uh, and that's pursuant to the state law that requires us to, to provide that information. Uh, with that, staff is happy to answer any questions. This is just an overall policy uh, that as CFDs will come forward, we'll work on, on revising the, the requirements of how we treat them, how we deal with them. We don't anticipate that there'll be a huge influx of these because there really is a, you're talking about a minimum $50,000 kind of entry fee just for the legal work to make something like this happen. And so this will be on larger parcels uh, that are really probably going to be more focused on our, our high growth areas, either in the, the north part of the city, you know, the south part of the city, maybe a little bit in uh, District 5 and District 7 on the western perimeters, or where you have some larger tracts of land, would we likely see anyone propose a CFD? It's not going to be something that we'd probably see on a smaller parcel basis. Councilwoman Williams. Alan, is there um, a minimum acreage to, that has to be included in this? Uh, Chairman Valenzuela, Councilwoman Williams, no, we don't include a minimum acreage as part of our proposal. Um, but certainly from a economy of scale and the cost associated with it, it's going to end up, you know, there will be some threshold where it won't be viable for a private property owner to come in and make it happen, but rather than arbitrarily decide one, we're leaving it open. Doesn't mean staff would have to support one. Maybe one of the things that council will deny is, look, even if somebody wanted to come out with a, a far out one, it doesn't make any sense to do it for a small parcel, and that would be part of a basis for denial. And for repayment, um, on Tatum Ranch, if I recall, that was residential, or at least as far as I know. Correct, yes. And then yeah. assessment on each house as it was developed went to repay. Is, do I remember that correctly? Yeah, so, so they had um, their property tax bill, just like all of us pay you know, every year when we have our property tax. They have a special assessment that shows up on there that would be an additional $250, whatever it would be to, to repay that debt. And so that would show up on their bill as a special tax assessment to repay that debt. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? So if I understand this correctly, the CFD, specifically on the Tatum Ranch, because I was not around during the Tatum Ranch. Um, I was 21 and not involved in politics. <laughs> uh, when that happened uh, and the bonds were issued, then they then this specific uh, Tatum Ranch then has to pay back this uh, bond. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes, Vice Mayor um, Pastor, that's correct. So basically, it's just like the property tax assessment. So when the county assessor goes out and assesses a property, there's a there's a fee related to that district that is, shows up on the property tax bills for those property owners in the district. And are the owners aware that they would have to pay this property this tax when they purchase this home? Yes. Yes. Okay. It, it really allows a, a developer to have access to. Uh, uh, this bonding capacity and capital to, to build those necessary infrastructure improvements that's more affordable. And so that's what it allows them to have access to build those really expensive infrastructure items that are needed. And that's really what stops development from happening, you know, out in the fringe where there isn't those, uh, that infrastructure because the city doesn't provide it. We make the private developer pay for that and this will make it a little more financeable for them to do that. And then the people who actually are benefiting from it are those future owners who live there. They're the ones that are responsible for paying back that debt over time, not the rest of the citizens. And, and if I could just add, I think that's another reason why they require the website so that all that information is out there before someone purchases a property in the district. Okay, so this reminds me of um, very much of the growth possibly in Levine, outskirts on the west side and then up north that could possibly um, be beneficial uh, to form a, a CFD. And so then then this is, it's, it's due to the bonding rate. Is that what I'm getting or no? What's advantageous? So, 
uh, Vice Mayor Pastor, I think what's advantageous about a CFD is it may be something where the infrastructure needs to be ahead of what we were originally okay. planning on doing. Got it. So it's putting in the water, the sewer lines, mm -hmm. all that in a partnership with this district, or yes. this is what the district Correct. allows. Okay. Correct. Got it. Thank you. I move approval. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any more comments? Any questions? We have no cards. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passed. Thank you. And while we're getting ready for item eight, I want to just acknowledge a couple of special guests that we have from the Be a Leader Foundation. We have Ruby from Maryville High School and Kate from Westwood High School, uh, both here shadowing me around. This is the sixth year in a row that we've been able to do this kind of thing, and they could be anywhere. They could be hanging out with a bunch of cops or at, at the airport or wherever, and they chose city government. The firefighters. They chose city government, and, and they're, they're amazing. So thank you for being here. All right, moving on to item eight. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the subcommittee. We are here today to talk to you about the possibility of bringing uh, the Arizona Thunderbird School, the ASU uh, School, the ASU Thunderbird School of Global Management here into downtown Phoenix. With me today is Eric Johnson, who is the Deputy Director over Community Development. Here in the audience, we have Stephanie Lindquist, who is the ASU Deputy Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. We have Alan Morrison, the CEO and Director General of the Thunderbird School and Rick Namark, the Associate Vice President for Program Development and Planning. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Eric Johnson to kind of take you through the history of this particular property. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks to the leadership and guidance of the Mayor and Council, uh, the City has been working in partnership with ASU since 2004 to establish our downtown Phoenix campus. Uh, most recently on this specific site, back in 2010, uh, City Council allowed uh, staff to go out and acquire uh, the block that is generally located between Polk and Taylor and 1st Street and 2nd Street in downtown. It was formerly a, a, an old hotel that was no longer being used. Uh, we received approval. We went and actually acquired that property in partnership with the Hotel Corporation. Uh, then uh, established a parking lot uh, for an interim use uh, for both the university's needs and the hotel's needs. Then in 2012, uh, ASU uh, came back to the city and uh, we are uh, very happy to work with them to establish uh, the law school downtown, uh, the View Center for Law Society. Uh, that did open in 2016, and uh, now we're coming back uh, for the remainder of the parcel, which was always uh, a site of location that ASU wanted to continue to expand their programs onto. Uh, this site is approximately one quarter of the block, so they're getting very efficient with the footprint. And uh, we are now here to present to you the uh, details of what they're looking to build. So in front of you, you see uh, the general concept rendering of what ASU is proposing to build on that remaining quarter of a block here in downtown. There are approximately 350 students today with Thunderbird in Glendale, and those students would be relocating into downtown Phoenix. So what you see again is kind of a concept rendering. Uh, they're still working on procuring and, and hiring their architects, so this may change a little bit, but this is a, a concept of what this would look like. If we look at what Thunderbird has planned in downtown today, the first phase would be interim improvements and lease uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, getting space ready at the Arizona Center. They would be occupying, they will be occupying 60,000 square feet beginning in the fall with 350 students. And that's where you see the interim improvements in downtown. They'd be in that space for approximately three years while they construct their Thunderbird a permanent home, which would be on that south portion of the Polk block at 100,000 square feet and approximately $60 million in capital investment. This would include office, classroom, lecture, ground floor, retail amenities, truly an addition to the downtown campus. Uh, ASU is also working towards building their uh, graduate school housing for Thunderbird, which would be on another site controlled by ASU. They are working towards whether that's built by ASU, whether it's through a public-private partnership, whether it is by ASU or private development, how that would work out. And that's approximately a $30 million investment in the future. As we look at our terms uh, that uh, we're proposing to the council to consider with ASU, uh, we would request that they start construction, and they're proposing to start construction by the end of summer 2019. 
the facility would open in the spring of 2021 reminding you that the program will come down here in the fall of this year, 2018. Staff's recommendation for council consideration is a $13.5 million participation in this, uh, in this project at $1.5 million a year. What staff would propose, we're currently paying on the law school. We finish our last payment of $1.5 million on the law school in 2020. What we would propose is out of the downtown reinvestment fund, we continue that $1.5 million a year to ASU in 2021 and for nine additional years. During that 10 year, uh, the first 10 years of operate, after the first 10 years of operation, ASU would pay the city $110,000 a year for land payment. This was not a land site that was acquired as part of the 2006 bond. It was acquired out of the downtown reinvestment fund. And what we would propose is that uh, be paid to the city for 15 years or a total of $1.6 million, which is in keeping with the land costs that are here in downtown Phoenix today. One of the questions that came out of our last uh, visit was from Councilman Nowakowski, uh, where he asked us what the downtown campus has provided in economic impact to Phoenix today. Uh, Councilman, we've spent time with Seedman, we've spent time running our own numbers since our last meeting, and on an annual basis, the downtown campus currently provides approximately a half a billion dollars of economic impact annually to Phoenix. Uh, that is inclusive of uh, 12,000 students, 1,900 faculty and staff. The 1,900 faculty and staff and 12,000 students then equate to 6,375 additional jobs that are created to support those students and are created to support that faculty and staff. Those students have a spending of approximately $167 million a year in the city of Phoenix. Um, so we see pretty strong economic impact out of that. Further, as we look at the 350 students for Thunderbird, we'd see approximately a 700 direct and indirect jobs, the additional jobs that would come as part of Thunderbird with an economic impact of approximately $40 million a year in addition to what's going on on the campus today. Uh, this, uh, what we see in the room nights of where they're at today, we'd see a, a approximately 9,000 additional room nights here in the downtown market. The student spending on the Thunderbird side is close to a million dollars a year in addition to what's going on in the downtown campus. So as we look at the direct revenue that the city of Phoenix would receive, and by direct revenue, these are taxes that the city of Phoenix could anticipate as a primary return. In years one through five, we would see $4.2 million. That's construction sales tax and lease tax relating to the Arizona Center space and the construction of the new Thunderbird School. In years six through 10, we'd see $2.7 million, and that's counting the new residential tower is built, and then the lease tax that those students would pay uh, on that facility, on their rent, on, on a monthly basis. On an annual operating from year 11 forward, we would see $535,000 in direct tax revenue, and that is predominantly in the lease tax and utility taxes that we see coming off of the residential. As we know, uh, ASU doesn't pay um, lease tax to itself, and so that's not collected. As long as they continue on at um, Arizona Center, that number would actually be higher than what we have in front of you today should they continue on that additional space. So what we would see is the investment that the city of Phoenix, uh, the uh, staff would be proposing to council would be fully paid back in direct tax to Phoenix in a 22 year period. We've, what we'll see in our law school investment is payback in approximately 17 years. Uh, staff is here today to recommend that this subcommittee consider, uh, consider moving forward to the full council uh, an affirmation of uh, relocating an, an in, uh, intergovernmental agreement with ASU for Thunderbird. And with that, we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, I'll open it up. Uh, we have some cards. Would you oh, like me to go to the, the cards, cards first? Okay, why don't we do that? We'll start with Kevin Roos, Mark in favor. Welcome. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> that was a really robust presentation. I wish I didn't have to follow that up with what I'm about to say. But um, my name is Kevin Roos. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of you today. Um, I am an alumnus from the very first class of Thunderbird after ASU's acquisition. I have wanted to be a Thunderbird since I was 14 years old. After realizing a career exists, we actually get paid to live around the world. After watching a tumultuous few years for the school, 
I was ecstatic when it was announced that Thunderbird would now be part of ASU, one of the most respected schools in the United States. After living and studying on campus for 18 months and graduating in 2016, my class started to hear mumblings of the campus closing down. When I received the email about Thunderbird's move downtown, I couldn't have been happier. I must have forwarded that email to about 30 people. I still think this is the best possible move for the school. I also think the move couldn't happen soon enough, and as someone who works on site at the Arizona Center, I would like to see T-Bird's integration into the bustling business environment downtown sooner rather than later. The school will have access to not only businesses, but other university resources and alumni. While one of the benefits of the Thunderbird having its own campus was our isolation leading to inclusion, it's time for Thunderbird's inclusion into the greater ASU community downtown. Needless to say, I highly support this measure on behalf of many enthusiastic alumni. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roos. Uh, next speaker is Brian Foster, marked in favor. Welcome. Good afternoon, council members. Brian Foster. I'm a 30 year resident of the city of Phoenix. I've also worked in downtown Phoenix for the last 30 years uh, and currently am housed in the Arizona Center, which is where Thunderbird would be temporarily anyway. I'm also the uh, chair elect of the Phoenix Sister Cities Commission. Uh, and I was just talking with, uh, with Laura. We're going to be traveling to Chengdu, China shortly to visit one of our sister cities. Um, as a downtown businessman for 30 years, as a stakeholder, I've seen the benefits that have come already from the ASU presence downtown, which wasn't here when I originally started. I've most recently also felt the uh, benefits from the law school coming downtown, both professionally, because we hire more people from ASU every year than anybody else does, but also in terms of what I've seen happen uh, to the economic development downtown and makes it much more of a thriving, fun place to work, um, good for business type of location. And I am here today to support, <coughs> to put forth my strong support for the intergovernmental discussion or agreement that's being uh, recommended today by staff because it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a home run for downtown Phoenix. Um, from my perspective as a businessman, it's gonna be great. From my perspective as the chair elect of Phoenix Sister Cities, uh, we have big plans to grow economic development between the city of Phoenix and these other currently 10 sister cities we have and the Thunderbird School of Global Management is a huge part of what we see the future of us being able to grow within our organization that growth. So I could not be a bigger proponent of the relocation or of the uh, city's um, stewards using city money to, to get us to where we need to be. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for taking that trip <laughs> as well. It's it's. <laughs> it's, in, it's incredibly important. It really is. And I'm only saying this because she's a very good friend, but what's, what's good for a couple of hours will wear on you <laughs> over a few days, and you asked for it. Well, I just got roasted, yeah. <laughs> you did get roasted. Right. The, the next speaker is Dan Clocky, uh, also marked in favor. Welcome, sir. Uh, Chairman Valenzuela, members of the subcommittee, uh, Dan Clocky with the Downtown Phoenix Partnership. Um, I just wanted to express my support for the school. We've had um, an amazing institution in Thunderbird sort of hiding in plain sight here for 70 plus years. Um, and they uh, produce students and members of our community that, that don't just stay here locally. They go nationally and internationally. They become some of the elite members of the business world throughout this globe. Um, and they are going to go out and represent us as, as a city. Um, and when they're making decisions, business decisions, in the years down the road, 
that's going to have an impact that they were they spent two uh, very important years of their life here. The second part of this is their executive education program, which brings executives from around the globe here to Phoenix. Um, and obviously, I love it for downtown, but it's good for the entire city. Um, these are folks who are decision makers, like I said, around the country and the globe. Um, and their ability to come here and talk a bit about business and think about possibilities for our town as well in the future, I think is incredibly important. So I'm in full support and, and hope you are too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clocky. We also have four, uh, four cards filled out by people who are in support, available to speak if, if, uh, if needed, but wishing not to speak. Debney Prius, Diane Holler, Cindy Goggin. Close enough. I'm sorry, what is it? Gone. Gone. Okay. That was Gone. my next guess. <laughs> and and David Kreider, Mr. Kreider, always good seeing you. Okay, so we're uh, th that's it for the cards. Any other questions or comments by my colleagues, Councilwoman Williams? Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this. Um, Thunderbird's been less than two miles from my house all these years, so I've always kept an eye on them over there. I'm very proud that they were even that close. Um, but I have a, a question for you. The fund that you're going to pay them with, where does that money come from? The Downtown Reinvestment Fund, uh, it, it actually comes from uh, other investments in private sector investment in downtown. It's rents for city leases. It's properties that we've sold that were originally funded by the Downtown Reinvestment Fund. It's not attached to the general fund. It's revenue that is collected through the private sector for lease payments and land payments that they make to the city of Phoenix. Totally separate from the general fund. Yes, ma'am. No increase in taxes. No, ma'am. Nothing but benefits as far as I could see. I would move approval of uh, the staff's recommendation. And I just want to say that the graduates are moving downtown, but the rest of the school is moving to ASU West, which I feel is very important and a real benefit to the city of Phoenix. It's a tremendous benefit for us on both sides, Councilwoman, where one is in moving in downtown, and as you, you mentioned, the other group will be uh, remain in the West Valley, which is tremendously important to the West Valley as it continues its growth pattern and driving those new tech and um, international companies into the West Valley. That's going to be a huge benefit for us as well on both sides. And we have some buildings for them just waiting. Beautiful buildings. <laughs> <laughs> you put an ad in wherever you can. <laughs> That's right. I made the motion to Great. We have a motion on the table. I'll second it. We have a second. And Councilman Alakowski, you have comments, mm -hmm. questions? I have a comment. Um, basically, um, I went to St. Mary's High School, so did um, Laura, and we've walked past that Ramada Inn for years and years. And, you know, we've seen downtown develop from where it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, to what it is now, and it's just amazing. And I really see a lot of it being ASU moving down to downtown. If it wasn't for the university moving down, I don't think we would have all this vibrant downtown that we have. I mean, we had the Arts District, which is the Roosevelt Row with um, with their uh, First Fridays. But I think that the university just added much more to that. We're talking about an extra half a billion dollars worth of tax revenues that ASU has brought into the downtown area. And we see, Kevin, how excited you are just to have it in downtown, you know, and um, have the Thunderbirds down here. It's just amazing. And as I talk to individuals that have graduated, the excitement of, and the opportunities that we have. I mean, we just heard from Dan about the opportunities of having workshops and think tanks of, of CEOs and decision makers, not just throughout the United States, but we're talking throughout the world, coming to downtown Phoenix for a weekend or for, for, a, couple, or for a week just the experience of what we have here. I mean, we're going to have the heads of big corporations and the thinkers and the decision makers. And that brings us to a whole new level. That really brings Phoenix to becoming that global city that we've been striving for. I know that our mayor has been traveling to Canada, um, to Mexico, and other parts of the world to really make Phoenix that global um, city that we're at. So I think this right now is going to put us on the map and it's just amazing in the resources that we're going to have. So I really want to thank um, ASU, 
for making that big step and and all their staff that made this possible and to our staff for putting this together and and, and my colleagues for making that difference here in the downtown area. Great, we have motion and a second. Any other questions, comments? I'll just make the comment that I'm also very excited to think of the, the growth and the story of downtown Phoenix and it truly started with the arts. It started with those neighbors uh, like Wayne Rainey is an example and those others on the, the Roosevelt Row artists that have inspired Dr. Crow to, and, and ASU to, to truly come to, to downtown and you know, it's those infrastructures and education and, and those investments in infrastructure and education that create a world-class city, which is what we have here in Phoenix. So between ASU downtown and the light rail and, and the private sector answering the call, such as red development and cityscape and all of those great things. And suddenly we, we've gone from 60 tech companies to just a few years ago to more than 300 today. And, uh, and it's because we are uh, building around the people of downtown uh, and and those assets like infrastructure and education. And this is a big one. It's you now we're going to bring Thunderbird into downtown Phoenix. We are a global city. More than 50 languages are spoken in Phoenix now. And and why not uh, have Thunderbird in downtown Phoenix uh, uh, as obviously part of ASU, which is worked out through ASU. But you know, we, we have a presence of all of our uh, public universities here in downtown. This is a great step to continue moving the city of Phoenix forward. Uh, I'm very excited about it. And I want to thank the ecosystem. You've got people like David Kreider who are here, and of course you, Chris. Chris Mackey, your economic development director and your team. Uh, but, but everyone is in this together, uh, working collectively as a, as a community and as this ecosystem to, to cheer on ASU and Thunderbird uh, and, and you know, wanting you to know that we want you here in downtown Phoenix and uh, you're, you're making us a better city. So uh, we're, we're gonna achieve the best possible version we can be. And, and this, is, uh, this takes us a step closer to that. So we do have a motion and a second. We, are, we have no more speaker cards. We'll go to a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, thank you. Okay, so now we will go to um, item nine, which is the FAA flight path update, which is a standing item for the last couple of years. And uh, do we have an update? Mr. Bennett. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we do, uh, we would like to share uh, some additional uh, information about the, uh, the flight path uh, update. And, uh, uh, also share some of the uh, uh, results of the community meetings that were held uh, by the FAA. So I'll turn it over to Jordan Fell, and uh, I'm also joined uh, by Deborah Ostriker, the Assistant Aviation Director. Jordan. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, we'll keep this very quick. Uh, so just a, a quick update. The community involvement workshops went very well. Approximately 400 people attended the, the, the three different open houses. And the FAA reports they received approximately 1,100 comments during the public comment period. So that's a pretty good turnout. Staff continues to work with the community and it kind of explain the process and continues to get phone calls and, and try to coordinate the information. The FAA is currently working on digesting all those comments and, and putting responses and kind of grouping them uh, on the FAA project website. And we expect that in the next week or week or two. So the FAA National Historic Property Act requirements kicked in in December. As you'll recall, the joint petition was filed on November 30th, and immediately the FAA uh, began to set up how they would consult with both the SHPO, State Historic Preservation Officer, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, and of course the City Historic Preservation Officer. And that process, uh, although it typically does move slowly, did go very well. And in fact, just recently on February 28th, the FAA offered its finding of no adverse effect for the west and northwest routes. They did not offer, uh, or they did not issue that finding yet for the southwest route. And that has to do with ongoing tribal consultation, which again, oops, yeah, has gone well, but again, tends to move a, a little more slowly. And I apologize, the screen's a little washed out here, but 
essentially what, if you could read those uh, words, it would say um, that because of the want to respect the timing of the tribes on their consultation, at least today it appears unlikely that the FAA will be able to implement the southwest route by April 1st. They will proceed with the west and northwest routes, which had the uh, finding of no adverse effect uh, by April 1st. And then the FAA expects to be able to complete the entire consultation process by May 24th and then would implement the southwest route at that time. And then every other uh, discussion regarding the step two process and what that would look like is, is still to be determined. So with that, uh, staff is happy to answer any questions or take any follow ones. Any questions or comments? Councilman Nowakowski. So the April 1st um, deadline, so that's not including the um, Southwest, which is the um, Estrella Levine area. And why is that? Why couldn't they have met with the um, tribal to have a review and to complete it by April 1st? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Councilman Nowakowski, great question. The FAA had two in-person meetings with the tribal agencies. And at either of those, the FAA probably could have given a hard deadline. But in practical terms, it doesn't work well to really try to, to push that issue and, and to try to get them to expedite their review. So the tribes have given the FAA assurance that they're looking at these things and they will work on the schedule that's in front of us here. But uh, th that's the sole reason. The FAA did not want to push too hard on the tribal's review. Now, as a city, can we ask for a deadline? Because the situation that we have a quarter of our city that's still going to be affected, and um, basically it happens to be an area where you have most of our minorities that actually live in that area. So then it turns into, is it because we happen to be in a low-income minority area that we're not being looked at? And so it's, it ends up being not just a tribal situation for the, for us as the city of Phoenix, but also how do we answer those difficult questions to those communities that are affected south of the river? Mr. Chairman, Councilman, we can certainly share that concern with the FAA and make sure the tribes understand that, that issue as well. So is there any solutions that you would recommend? Is there a letter that we can write on behalf of the city of Phoenix asking for a deadline that's something reasonable that because the way it's written right there, it, it can take maybe a year, two years, three years. What's yeah. reasonable, right? Well, again, Mr. Chairman, Councilman, we do have good confidence that the tribal coordination will complete in time for the May 24th deadline. But I don't think it hurts either to, to ask for you know, timely review. Well, I really don't have that confidence in the FAA because um, that's the reason why we ended up suing them and we had some community individuals suing um, the FAA and we actually won. So I believe that um, if they were good partners, we, we as a city would have never ended up suing the um, FAA. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, to Councilman Nowakowski, um, we will be conversing with the regional administrator in just a couple of days, as well as with the tribal councils. And we will uh, ex pass along your thoughts as well as see if we can come up with a strategy and uh, find out specifically who we should have your letters go to, what they should say in order to uh, gain more confidence that May 24th would be the date. And if not, um, then what is the expectation so that you all have a comfort level of a, of a date that you can rely on? I think you deserve that at this point. All right, thank you. Hey, Vice Mayor. So it says on that slide, um, pending tribal review, proceed with the southwest route changes by 524. And what I just heard is that there is there was, for the tribal review, there is no um, deadline um, to be submitted in the sense of uh, what their uh, comments are, what their review is. Um, so, like in any bureaucracy, I can sit on it till 525, July something, or never really do anything with it. So uh, I am going to ask staff to uh, 
figure out some solutions or where we need to have dialogue with uh, our tribal partners uh, just to get an understanding of where they're at. Uh, it may not be in, in our favor, but I believe we have to have that dialogue and come up with solution with our tribal partners in order to uh, push FAA. Um, so uh, those, those are my thoughts. Mr. Chairman, to the Vice Mayor, um, if you would uh, give us next week to speak with them and come back to you with exactly what you're asking for, uh, not only uh, where and how, what a letter should say, but what the commitments could be so that we can either get their commitment for a particular date that you can uh, rely on or that they have an explanation to you of what it is that is going to happen next. Do you know the process of the tribal review? What is the tribal review? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Vice Mayor. So the consultation process is nearly identical to the SHPO or CHIPO review process. So once the FAA issues its finding, the FIPO has 30 days to respond. The FAA hasn't issued that finding yet. So at the moment, they're allowing the tribes to give more feedback. Once that finding gets issued, they'll have 30 days. But that all said, I think more substantively, what you're asking is, what is the real shot clock on this? And the answer to that is the FAA has made a good faith effort at this point. So uh, following up on Ms. Ostriker's points, there will be additional consultation over the next two weeks. And if for some reason that doesn't look like it's going, as we all expect, and even the tribes would tell you that, uh, we would then have to get to, I think, what you're referring to, which is here. here's kind of the deadline we're, we're going to set as community partners with all parties. But I don't know that we're quite there yet. I, th I think we're in better shape. All right. Uh, well, we don't. Well, this is. Yeah, OK, it is. It is for information, but Mr. Kleiman, did, did you resist the question? Yeah, please. Okay. First of all, you're all formally invited to our April 1st party outside. Um, <laughs> all right. But looking at this and the concerns in regards to the Southwest route, looking at the map on the slide previous, I mean, is, is a concern being raised by the FAA to make sure, because the blue lines in the which are the existing flight paths and the purple lines, which are the new flight paths, seem to be coinciding where they're going over any Native American lands. So I guess my concern is, what's the FAA's delay in proposing their final order to this when it's not really a new flight path in regards to where it's crossing the, this, this land? So that would be my question to that. and. Uh, Otherwise, like I said, I, my follow-up question also is just, there's nothing that needs to happen between now and April 1st for the west and northwest flights to nothing, no I's dotted, T's crossed by the city or the FAA for that to happen. It's ready to go. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to members of the committee, uh, yes, it, it is ready to go. And in fact, on the northwest and the west routes, uh, the actual implementation is uh, likely to be on March the 29th and not April the 1st. It'll be March the 29th when they will start flying the northwest and the westerly departures. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate it. We're, thank you very much. We'll move on to the final call to the public. We have no cards for that. Future agenda items. Any uh, requests from my colleagues for agenda items? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.